Uh, do you want to just like roll into the podcast? Do you want to just get going? Sure. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, this is the dialogue box. I'm here this week with Tom Francis. Hello. Hello. This is. Uh, I feel weird introducing you because I feel like everybody knows you. But <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> you're uh, you're kind of a big deal since I'm. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Been around a bit. Um, so yeah, how do we get started? Who is Tom Francis? You want me to introduce me? Yeah, yeah. I can do that. Uh, I used to write for PC Gamer for nine years. And uh, during the last three years of that, I was making an indie game in my spare time. And that game was Gunpoint. Um, and that came out in 2013. Uh, yeah. And I've been an indie developer full time since then. Um, and the last game was Heat Signature, uh, which came out 2017. God, three flies. years ago. That's crazy. Um, and now uh, we are working on uh, Tactical Breach Wizards, which is um, a turn-based tactics game about wizards in Kevlar. Um, and also, uh, it's worth saying that uh, all three of those games were made with um, my artist, John Roberts. And for Heat Signature and Tactical Breach Wizards, I'm also working with a programmer, John Winder. Nice. OK, so there's a lot there. Let's start with, uh, you've been working with the same artist for, yep. what was that, like a decade now? Nice. <laughs> God, is that true? Yeah, it is. Yeah, 2010. Well, probably like he came on to Gunpoint after probably more than a year. So yeah, nearly a decade. Um, he is incredible. Uh, and us working together has not been, uh, we didn't like form a company together or anything. Um, it, with each project, I've, uh, you know, cast the net wide to look for an artist and he's always been the one that's the best. Um, because the first game, Gunpoint, it was pixel art. He had never done pixel art before, and the like, the art in that game is amazing. Um, well, uh, so that kind of blows my mind. So you brought him on. You were on. You were working on Gunpoint for three years while you were working full time at PC Gamer. And yep. how did you afford an artist? Did you guys agree to do it for, like for royalties or? Yeah, just all rev share. Um, rev share. So everyone on Gunpoint. There was actually six of us on Gunpoint by the end, uh -huh. um, and everyone was rev share. Cool. Okay. Six of you. Wow. How many? I mean, that was a. I mean, it's a beautiful game. So, uh, what was the break, the makeup of the team? <laughs> uh, so it was me doing the writing, programming, and design, and sound design, and level design, and then two artists and three musicians. <laughs> <laughs> this is because it's because of the way I found them, which is um, I just sort of like put an open call for like, hey, does anyone want to be an art artist on this game and send send me some samples or something, um, and then. Uh, the samples we got uh, for both art and music, um, there was, in both cases, there was one that was the one I wanted for the main artist or main composer. And then there would be individual samples sent in by other artists, musicians that I really loved. So in the case of art, um, uh, Fabian Van Dommelen did, the, did some incredible city backdrops. And so I wanted his backdrops, but John Roberts um main art um and then for music uh ryan ike did the uh, the best mission music which is the most important thing the thing we'd need the most of mm -hmm. um but then john robert matz did the best theme tune this really beautiful lonely sax uh piece and um francisco Zerda did the best uh sort of like lounge jazz for the shop and um i couldn't you know uh, bear to lose these things. They're so beautiful and perfect that I just uh, um, said, can I have these and uh, give you a rev share for that? Like a, obviously a much smaller rev share than the main composer. Um, yeah. But that whole process, although it led to great results, um, I learned later through talking to you know, freelance uh, friends um, that asking people to submit a sample for a job just on spec, just for no money, um, mm -hmm contributes to uh, a situation where freelancers are just expected to do that. Like people who are um, not just freelancers, but people going for jobs as well, like um, for full-time employment um, are just expected to do an extraordinary amount of work for free, just for the hope of getting a job. Yeah. And when I started that process, I, in my head, I was thinking, well, if, you know, if it's not a good deal for you, then just don't do it. It's easy. <laughs> no problem. Right. Um, and I, since, uh, learned a lot about uh yeah how you can kind of make a bunch of decisions that all seem to make sense individually but overall contribute to a culture that's actually kind of um harmful and 
and just creates problems for um, folks looking for work. Yeah, it's hard to say because like the, um, I mean, it's not just freelance artists, right? Like I had to do animation tests for every job and in a way yeah. it's, uh, it's so normal. It's hard to imagine that not being the case. It's actually hard <laughs> to explain. Like it's especially, uh, I, I almost feel like it's a stamp of, like, of course, Blizzard is going to ask you to do it. Like an important studio would. Maybe you're not going <laughs> to do it if some scrappy little anim, like if some some little indie team wants you to do an animation test. That's ridiculous. But you know, like Blizzard, they're re they're serious and they're taking this seriously, and so you should too. Uh, there's kind of like a mentality behind that sort of thing. It is very different if you're a freelancer, though, because because the job, like if you're applying for Blizzard, you're hopefully working there for like a decade or something, yeah. right? So a little bit more work up front is probably feels a little better. But I also yeah. feel that um, if you're a big enough deal that doing an animation test for you is, you know, makes sense and, and feels worthwhile, you, you're also a big enough deal that you could pay them. True. Yeah. That's what, so for Heat Signature, we did a similar thing. Um, but this time I just asked for people's portfolios, just existing work. And then the, the favorites uh, of those, I paid to do a test um, and then hired from that. Oh, I see. So that's for this new game, Tactical Breach Wizards, or for Heat Signature as well? That was for Heat Signature. Um, okay. Tactical Breach Wizards, uh, we haven't done that process at all because, uh, so Heat Signature, like I say, we we again sort of cast the net wide for like, uh, I knew I didn't want to do pixel art and I knew John as a pixel artist. And so I was looking for just, um, uh, I figured that the best person for this game wouldn't be the best person for the last game. And so did the same process, but again, with, with that change so that um, I wasn't asking for free work. Um, and he applied and his was the best again. <laughs> and so I worked with him again. And then for Tactical Breach Wizards, um, Again, we kind of parted ways. Like he was going to do his own thing, and um, I was resigned to like, oh, I'll have to hire like five people to replace him. <laughs> um, and uh, this time, I didn't put out a call for artists. I wasn't kind of ready for that. But we, we were just hanging out. And I was just talking about what I was working on, and um, uh, he started getting excited about the idea. And he would just send me concept art for Wizards in Tactical Gear. Um, and it was brilliant. And it was exactly what I needed as well, because I couldn't really announce the game until I had something visual. Because there's yeah. such a, the joke kind of needs visuals to sell it, I think. Um, and so, uh, I yeah, said, the, like, the cone, the traffic cone in the head for the wizard and stuff was really, <laughs> really brilliant. I dig it. I love the way you, in general, how you make games is actually very similar to like what I think we should do with, uh, as indies, which is more of a um, like Hollywood model, you know, keep a core tight team. Because if I understand this correctly, you are a one person studio for the most part right and you hire contractors off-site for uh for what it what the project needs rather than yeah, building so a studio. Uh, all of our games are a team effort and i don't i never do art or music so those are always someone else um and on heat signature um i also had help with the programming and i would i do again with tactical breach wizards uh but in terms of the company uh suspicious developments is um uh sort of just me <laughs> the, the the company structure in the background is actually a bit more complicated than that but it's probably not worth um getting into but i i think the w what i like about this is that it allows you to get together the group of people you need to make this specific game so it's a it's a game first kind of way of thinking about things where you figure out what the game is you want to make and then you get together the perfect group to make that game as opposed to yeah. starting a studio and then figuring out um, I, I mean, there is an argument for starting a studio, getting people who are really used to working together really, really well, and then seeing what you guys make when you collaborate and always making making games for that studio. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it suited me well because the key thing for me is I need like at least six months to just screw around with prototyping without mm -hmm. anyone needing anything from me. <laughs> like I just need to be able to do it, do that by myself and figure out what game I want to make and, you know, does it work and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I dig it. I dig it. So for um, so tactical breach wizards, let me see. So that you began this about three years ago now. Um, I assume you took like a break yeah. between. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it's it it two and a bit years ago. Maybe two and a half now. Yeah. Uh, okay. And you spent like how long would you say you spent in just like brainstorming phase where it was you figuring out what you wanted to make? Um, that's a good question. I. Because it was kind of being brainstormed while Heat Signature was still being finished as well. Because um, I remember the actual sort of the idea came together um, 
in early start of 2017 because I was out in Seattle um, uh, sort of visiting Valve and working from their offices for a while. And in my uh, downtime, I, I kept thinking I was playing so much XCOM 2 and I just kept thinking, man, I really want to make an XCOM type game to fix all the things that I think <laughs> could be better, especially clarity. I was just finding like I'm so often unclear on what I can and can't do and how things work. And if I move there, will I be able to do this? Um, and I was thinking that I wanted a game where you know you could just uh, all of those questions would be answered, either by making the game much clearer or being able to rewind every decision so you can try it and, and see. And the only thing was I didn't had loads of ideas for a game like this, but I had no theme. There was nothing. It was just, uh, just I guess it's just soldiers or something. I don't know. <laughs> and just like, there's a big question mark in the document, like, what is the theme? Um, and then I kind of flash back to this running joke we used to have at PC Gamer. Um, it was only a few of us, and most of them don't remember it now. <laughs> and none of us can figure out who originated it. Um, but we were just sort of joking about what would Call of Duty be like if your team were just wizards for some reason. And you'd sort of never explain it, and uh, no one else is wizards. Uh, and they're still wearing Kevlar and, and um, have tactical gear and everything. Wait a minute. Wait and, so are you fighting wizards as well? Or do they have um, guns and you're wizards? Is it like wizards versus... That part the original like joke with thing we're joking about was just it was just your team that wizards and no one else in the world is <laughs> and that, that's just a completely inexplicable change um as i've developed this into an actual game like once that clicked in with the oh i want to make an indie XCOM, um uh those two things uh kind of bolted together and then i started thinking more about more seriously about okay what is this what kind of game is this is it story driven is it roguelike is it um that kind of thing and it's still important to me that most of the things that you're doing, the people you're fighting, are not magical. Um, mm -hmm. I want you to be up against just people with guns uh, because that's kind of part of the joke for me is that you're wizards and they're just trying to shoot you. <laughs> um, but uh, that is not really sustainable for the entire game, I think, for, for the game to get interesting, especially when I'm trying to make a game with emergent uh, play. So things... It tends to be that just shooting someone with a gun is one of the least emergent things you can do. <laughs> um, and so uh, we do need enemies that could shoot you with guns as like the standard fodder. But I think the bosses are going to be often magical or have something to them. Interesting. I am so excited for this game. I loved XCOM so awesome. much. I love tactics games so much in general. Did you uh, did you get really into Into the Breach by chance? Yeah, I did. And that's so definitely more uh, less XCOM, I... more JRPG kind of style, but more puzzly. Yeah, I think we are probably closer to Into the Breach than XCOM, but we're definitely between the two. We're further in the, um, uh, further towards like simulation and, and realistic look than, than Into the Breach is. Into the Breach is obviously very abstracted and it's almost like, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's actually the same size as a chessboard, the levels. Um, yeah. And we are a little bigger than that and a little more sort of um, trying to resemble reality uh, rather mm -hmm. than making a purely kind of board game type thing. Um, I think. I generally, like, when I think of tactics games, I split them into games that are kind of, I, I call them Japanese versus American, which is not true, but um, <laughs> I think of it like, you have games like XCOM where you have uh, cover height, for instance, um, you have half cover and you have cover, and then you've got games like Disgaea or Final Fantasy Tactics, where it's more about where you are positioned, how far you are away from them, um, maybe whether or not you're facing the character, your facing matters more. And to me, they just feel extremely different, and I can't say why. Like they, there's something about XCOM being so focused on guns and uh, <laughs> where guns and cover height, whereas JRPGs tend to be focused on you can hit something in a plus shape, right? That's some somewhere kind yeah. of like in a perimeter. And to me, that just feels like a fundamentally different game. It's a lot more. I've always felt like. XCOM is more maybe strategic and, and actually based on like military tactics, whereas like a Disgaea JRPG tends to be more uh, strategic in more of a puzzly kind of a way, which I think yeah. that's why I always put Into the Breach as kind of being on that other side, closer to what I consider JRPGs. I don't have a real good word for this. Uh, anyway, I, yeah, I, I can just, see that. Where would you think? So are you thinking like cover height and half cover height? Are you thinking... We are between those two. Our cover system is this uh, question mark that's just, <laughs> it's in the game, like it exists. We have cover and we have a take cover ability that we can let enemies use and we can let you use it. But right now uh, it's not being used. And there's something, uh, I just tried like 
giving you the ability to take cover and that inevitably means that you don't uh shoot um on your turn you do that instead of shooting and then i just found i would never do it and so now i'm thinking that maybe cover a definitely like half height covers in the game and there are also walls um and so i guess that's that's not the same thing as full height cover actually is it xcom in xcom full height cover means they can still shoot you but they have a much lower chance mm -hmm. whereas like that's distinct from being completely out of line of sight uh, so we only have completely out of line of sight or you're in cover um and right now cover doesn't do anything at all <laughs> but i think it's going to be a thing where like it's just all um uh automated so that like if enemies are behind cover when you select the ability to shoot them i think we'll have them all duck down at that point so that you can see who you can and can't shoot and if they're behind cover you just can't shoot them because we're not going to do any chance to hit kind of stuff it's all going to be um either it works or it doesn't i see where do you um how do you begin with a game like this how do you begin finding the fun uh like how did you do it with uh like because there's certain games where you need a you can write it all down and you can have a lot of theory, but until you have a certain amount of content, content being the characters, the enemy types made, like you can't really be sure that it's fun or not. And some games are fun yep. instantly, right? Like, yeah, like some games that is, yeah. Where does this that's fall? That's definitely uh, an issue in that this is a thing I discovered on Heat Signature actually. For ages, Heat Signature was just promising. Like for two years, it was just promising. You could tell like, oh, there's something here. This is definitely, it's cool to go inside spaceships. Once you get there, it's like, it's all right, but there's just nothing that exciting to it. And I was stuck designing it because I assumed that because that's a big deal, like it needs to be extremely fun and it's only vaguely fun. I felt that there must be some fundamental shift that needs to take place like the whole context of the game has to change or the interaction rules need to change or something and actually the solution was exactly what you say which is it just needed more content it just needed like a bunch of different types of grenades and a bunch of different types of teleporters and a different types of armor on the enemies and as soon as you have enough ingredients suddenly the magic just comes out of that um and that was a hard learned lesson on heat signature now that i know that it's made me a lot more chill about tactical breach was it's you know it's taken a long time just to get to the point that we can make content for it um but i've been a lot more relaxed about it because i just sort of feel in the back of my head like it'll get more interesting by just adding stuff to it and because as long as we know what kind of stuff can be added then that'll work out once there's more stuff then there's more choice especially the more the closer you get to like an rpg where it's literally just the loop is getting stuff which changes like your abilities and stuff um but that's interesting the... Yeah, so we, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, we are, the po point we're at right now is I focused on making sort of tutorial type content, tutorial slash puzzle type content. And mm. um, it's been a kind of goal for the early design of the game that we don't lock ourselves into either a prescriptive puzzle type game uh, versus a free form um, randomized type game. I wanted to ensure that we don't make any decisions that lock us into one of those things because we need to know, we need to try both and see which is more fun. And also, I'm pretty certain we will need both types of content in the game. Like, if nothing else, we will need a tutorial that teaches you how to use an ability. And you can't do that in a totally freeform, sandbox, randomized way, as I've learned the hard way, <laughs> again, with Heat Signature. Um, and so I focused on the tutorial type stuff because I know that when we uh, do our first round of testing, I will need to explain how the game works. So we'll need that you know, as early as possible. And we're just now at this point where that is pretty much done. And uh, I need to start making more freeform encounters and see how, how fun they are and what we need to add to that. And so we have a lot of elements that can be used for those that I haven't really played around with yet. I don't really know um, how well they're working and how many more we need. Um, and in particular, I think I'm working on right now is like a, a boss enemy. So we talked about like, the magical versus non-magical. This is the first magical enemy I've been making. So just thinking up what kind of abilities it has and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just getting to that now. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, it's awesome. Dude, yeah. The um I mean I'm I'm thinking about making a good base game too. Something a little a lot smaller than I think what you are. Probably more in the the Japanese style. I don't know how to put it, more puzzly right. kind of style thing. But just getting started is very difficult. And I uh, I think 
there is just a certain amount of stuff you need for the game to be interesting. As soon as you have a, uh, as soon as people can make their own decisions about like, how do you put it? Uh, as soon as it's a choice, how you build your team, uh, and and you can choose to like have a your glass cannon versus your tank versus things like this. It, and it's it becomes your strategy rather than just like a strategy that's placed for you. I I hope that's where it gets fun. We'll see. I haven't been doing yeah. this as long as you have, but. Um, so is, is your thing a, um, are you building a squad? Can you talk about it at all? <laughs> oh yeah, I, I don't know what I'm doing yet. I started this two weeks ago, man. Like, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I've, I've been thinking about it for a while. It's one of those things where you always think about a lot of different things and then eventually you, uh, like it's time to start the next game. So I picked one. Yeah. Yeah. But what are your, what are your goals for it? Do you think? Um, oh, damn. <laughs> you can uh I'm gonna, decline to answer yeah i'm gonna on punch on that of, one right now okay <laughs> uh, it's, on the grounds of it's been a, it has not been long enough and i don't even know even if you have ideas it's hard to find the words at least for me like it takes a while right. to get to that place where you can say the words i think my so a lot of my game ideas come from frustrations with other games uh like oh. i said this one's kind of born out of both my love for XCOM, but also my like oh why can't i tell why this doesn't work or uh, that kind of stuff and uh, the desire to kind of fix those problems um mm. and this in this case it's merged with another thing that's not really a frustration with a specific game but more of a um a shortcoming in the whole like genre of emergent games um i feel like they don't do a good job of getting people on board with that i don't think they explain themselves very well i don't think they encourage you to experiment and make you feel safe to to try things and discover these these cool um mm. uh, tactics and plans and so one of the goals for for breach wizards is that we want to do that we want to make it a kind of welcoming emergent game like one that you can if you bounced off deus ex and if you um uh never got into never got into Splunky enough to figure out why it was supposed to be special. Um, I'd like to make a game where you can discover that stuff, where we bring you on board kind of gently with some tutorial puzzle type stuff, and then sort of gradually um, give you more and more free reign and make sure that you know about some some particular neat tricks and then let you discover more by yourself in a, in a way that you don't have to worry about the consequences of, of what you do. Because we, uh, Heat Signature being an emergent game, that is also a roguelike with permadeath. Uh, pretty quickly discovered a very well-defined set of players who are just never going to try anything interesting if the stakes are that high. If they can potentially lose their character, they're just never going to do the fun stuff. They're always just going to be as conservative and safe as possible. So I really want to fight back against that. Mm -hmm. I generally find like uh, Darkest Dungeon was amazing for that. I, I would take risks in that game, for instance. I would let uh, I, I let some people die and stuff just because the you don't lose your Hamlet. Like no matter what, you don't lose everything. You might lose a party, mm. you might lose some people, but you don't lose everything. And uh, that was one of the, cause I'm one of those people that bounces off of roguelikes. I generally want to feel some kind of like sense of progression when I play. Uh, mm. I generally, if, if I know this permadeath, I play extremely safe and that makes the game yeah. not fun. And then I just stop playing. Same thing with like, um, I didn't play XCOM with permadeath on. I, I think you can, right? Like, uh, yeah, you can. I would not advise anybody on earth to ever do that. <laughs> not because, not because like uh, that high stakes gameplay isn't uh, doesn't have value, but just because there are enough bugs in the game that you can get, you can literally lose your star soldier just to a, a straight up glitch. Just like this wall looks like it isn't there, but your grenade hit it and then you died. <laughs> so if you yeah. want to play Iron Man XCOM. Turn Iron Man, Iron Man off, but just like make it a rule that you don't load your save game unless you actually hit a genuine bug. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, I just have no desire whatsoever to do that. I just don't feel like the uh, <laughs> I, I, Iron Man mode has never appealed to me in any game for some reason. Um, but I will say what you're saying right now is heresy because the indie thing is absolutely no tutorials. <laughs> um, very dif very difficult gameplay don't you know like these are the things that indies stand for traditionally uh this is what makes us cool and unique yeah i've never really been on board with that i think i i think because i took gunpoint to a lot of shows and watched people play it and the more you watch people play 
Um, actually, at gunpoint was only a couple of them, but the heat signature took a lot of shows. And just watching people struggle to understand your game and to and get brutally punished for just trying things in an innocent way is so horrible to watch. It's just like, oh god, I like heart goes out to you. Your everything you're doing is totally reasonable and totally right, and my game is just fucking punching you in the face for it. <laughs> and it shows, in particular, that is um, you'll see people get dispirited and walk away. And that's probably not representative of what it's like for people sitting at home having just bought a game. But I still even so, I don't want my game to be punching people in the face for, for doing things that, that are sort of, you know, the right kind of play. Yeah, at least not within like the first 10 minutes. I feel like uh, shows are amazing for testing your on-ramp. Uh, yeah. Or for watching, my favorite thing was watching, uh, where was I? I was in some show out in the UK and they had a bunch of little children there. And one kid just came up and like started rolling his face across the keyboard and he found... <laughs> the most interesting bugs like i've never <laughs> i've never stuff qa could not test that kid found like instantly it didn't occur to me to just like maybe i need a cat maybe i just need something to just to hit random keys very rapidly i don't know but uh yeah there was a story about a, a nasa engineer whose son i think she had she brought the software home and she was um uh, just had it open and her son just sort of mashed some random keys and it revealed like a, a really like fatal state that the software could get into. If you did these things in a totally irrational order, it could get kind of locked up and you couldn't get it out of that state. And she said to her bosses, like, hey, we should fix this. Like, I know there's no reason to press the sequence of keys, but just in case anyone ever does, we should have a workaround for that and just make sure it can get out. And she was kind of um, uh, shushed, basically. And they said, no, that's not important because our astronauts are highly trained. They're never going to do this. And then on the mission, they actually did hit that exact sequence of keys and the software locked up and it was a serious problem. <laughs> oh, that's funny. See, that's uh, also space madness. We don't know what happens out there. It's possible. <laughs> yes, you gotta be You're supposed to work for NASA. You're supposed to, you know, hedge against this shit. No, that's funny, dude. I love it. Watching kids play is, is amazing. One of my favorite moments watch, uh, watching people play Gunpoint was... Um, we had two machines set up side by side. I think this was at Minecon, and um, a a young kid and his dad both sat down at these machines. And within sort of ten minutes, the kid was showing the dad how to play the game. Like yeah. the dad was getting stuck everywhere, and the kid just immediately took to it and just grasped it um, right away. Yeah, some kids just take off. The, that was the same thing happened with Kind. Like I'd watch adults struggle forever, and then these three kids came up from middle school. They just I was like, do you need help? Nope. Just picked up the controller and just <laughs> played the game. Like, it was not even a challenge. Uh, in fact, one of them hit, like, a problem at, oh, God, like, 20 minutes in, and the other one was like, oh, give me that, and they just fixed it. <laughs> it was embarrassing. They were better than me. But, yeah, the did age you, age is no when, no bearing on that. So, when you showed Kai and it shows, did you end up making a lot of changes in response to that? Yes, but again, mostly a lot of that stuff was very focused on the on ramp because I couldn't. Yeah. Uh, I would put a timer into the game so people couldn't play more than like twenty minutes, just because you're supposed to cycle people in and out of your booth. You only have so many stations, mm. and so it's a great way to test to see all of the frustrations and problems that can happen in exactly the first twenty minutes. That was extremely well tested in kind. Yeah. Uh, do you do stuff like um, with the puzzle game? Are you trying to? like build a level to teach players a particular kind of trick that they will need to have in their tool set to tackle later puzzles. Yes, exactly. Uh, it's each, each puzzle kind of builds on the other ones. There's other ideas to it too. Like you want one that's quick and short and easy. And then one, maybe like two quick ones, then one long, hard one. And then maybe you almost kind of want like a boss battle, like a, you want to <laughs> always end any given sequence with one puzzle. That's just really, um, difficult or bigger or even if it's not harder just seems bigger and more impressive yeah. you can kind of make something seem bigger and more impressive without actually making it harder um not that i did that very well I, like i have certain regrets about kind I, I wish i had uh there's a lot more stuff i wish i'd cut um i think the there's some some stuff that came online later mostly the stuff where i like tied the narrative into the puzzles when i was looking into I wanted to have a narrative and I wanted to have these two characters fall in love and I wanted them to like go on a boat together on a, on a little boat ride or I wanted to have one date where they would go dancing together and I looked at choreography of like figure skating and dancing and things like that and I tried to build a puzzle where you had to do that and those were really good but most people that's like the middle of the game 
So uh, I don't think it, I wish I'd cut more of the earlier and later stuff and had more of that kind of stuff in the game, I guess is the better way to put it. But you can't spend, hmm. you know, an eternity on a game. You can't just always be throwing out everything and restarting. Yeah. Um, is that because, is that stuff, do you think people are getting stuck on that stuff that you wish you cut and then not get, not reaching the good stuff? No, I think people, people, the, um, how do I put it? The part of the game that I like the least is when you're on the main stage and you have the three characters together. And it's, that's, that content I made, I think, within the first year. Um, hmm. And that was before I had this concept that there would be a narrative or I knew really what I was doing. Like, I don't, I don't go into making games, <clears throat> sorry, uh, in the same way you do, right? Like, I don't usually start with a game I like and think about what I dislike about it. With Kind, I was just like, this would be fun. This is neat. Like, there was no, then eventually I figured out what I was actually making after I'd made it. And then I, I kind of went and reworked a lot of the stuff to fit the same themes. Like, I, I had ideas. I knew I, I wanted a character, uh, how do I put it? Actually, with Kind, I started with this idea that these characters, um, roll around and push off of the walls, right? It was actually a, a movement thing. And I was like, what, how can I make this interesting? And I figured it had to be a puzzle game. That was the only way to make this movement interesting. Um, and then from that, I started making puzzles with it. And I had watched a film called La La Land. And I was like, OK, I want I want this to be this little cube that's pulling around and pushing off of walls. It has a personality. It's a musician. And then over time, it just kind of became kind. And there was a story. And there was these. There's Euler, Quat, and Rue. And, you know, oil, you can't go between Euler and Quat without Rue. And I just came up with a certain rule systems here that have to do with them. And um, so it was, I make games like a pachinko machine, like a ball going through a pachinko <laughs> machine. I'm just making decisions. And then in the end, uh, theoretically, you scrap all that once you figured out, okay, here's what's good about this. And you just focus on that. And I don't think I did enough of that. I think I, I left some, some content in the game that I wish I had just gutted and redone. Um, right, but I, nobody was playing that because I didn't really test like that late middle part of the game. Yeah, that was so. You were saying about like having a twenty minute limit when you showed at shows. I never yeah. did that, even though I know that the show organizers probably want me to. Yeah. But I, if anyone was willing to play for like an hour, I really wanted them to do that because I'd never seen anyone play. You know, the missions that come up an hour into Gunpoint, and I was delighted if anyone just hogged the machine for ages because like this is valuable feedback. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll do that in the future. Did you do I any testing outside of shows, just like with, you know, closed beta or anything? Uh, not really, no. With Kind, I, I um, like this was supposed to be a smaller project, theoretically. <laughs> uh, I did QA testing, like I paid some QA testers to test, especially because I had to for the different consoles and stuff. And I did have like a yeah. friends and family. I sent it out to uh, maybe 40 people that, were, that I was pretty close with okay. and got feedback in that way. Um, yeah but not anything public, not with strangers. I do know, right. uh, like when I was in AAA, for instance, we would obviously, uh, we would have that thing where you sit people down and they you have them play the game and you record them and you have eye tracking so you know exactly what they're looking at. <laughs> you know, like the, the proper play tests. I do miss that yeah. stuff. Yeah, I've never done that. Um, I've always relied on our tests are usually like 1,000 to 2,000 people who signed up for our mailing list and we send them a steam key and then they they play and they fill in a form afterwards um and that is pretty good um for gunpoint we did that and we specifically asked people like what is your favorite level and what is your least favorite level and we showed them like screenshots of the levels so they could remember what was what um and then after each round of testing i would find the least popular level and just delete it <laughs> and then just look at the best level and then see how can I make another level that's kind of you know why is that good and how can we make more levels like that and so we did that about five times just deleting the worst level and trying to build on the best level um, and that was my process for like weeding out the the chaff there and that was partly because I was able to do that partly because the puzzles have almost nothing to do with the plot like the the mission is related to the plot like the reason you're trying to get to this computer is a, is a story reason but the actual like what you have to solve to do that really has nothing to do with where it happens in the game and so we can we could fairly easily just kind of remove a level and just put a different one there mm -hmm. yeah i dig it dude that's awesome how we, so how long have you been working on your mailing list because you've uh um that definitely was set up during gunpoint so um must be yeah like 
<laughs> uh, 18 years. No, wait, sorry, uh, eight years. Uh, math is difficult. But <laughs> that is, we kind of, um, there's more people on it than I need as testers, and I don't want to give them all a copy of the game <laughs> for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. uh, since it's kind of my core uh, audience, I think. Um, so what we usually do is just set up like a, a new mailing list um, and get people to sign up to that. And so it's kind of a ridiculous dance because you email the big mailing list and say, hey, sign up to the small mailing list if you want to be on this particular test, just so that if we if we email a thousand people, we know it's a thousand people who actually want in on this. We don't email a thousand keys to, to you know, 700 people who don't want them and 300 who do. Mm -hmm. um, but then that's complicated because if you just set up your mailing list, almost everyone will have the email go to spam because if they've never received an email from it before and it's not kind of Gmail hasn't had a chance to acclimatize to it, um, it's incredibly untrusted. So what we actually do is have them, uh, everyone on the big list, go and sign up to the small list. After they sign up to the small list, I take all those names, cross-reference it with the big list and add a flag to all of those people and then email them from the big list just to that subset, <laughs> which is ridiculous, but that's how I've done it in the past. Damn, yeah, that's intense. That's uh that's an awesome community though that you're managing there and that you've done it for eight years. I don't Yeah, uh, it's really it's really nice to have that um to kind of fall back on and um uh it's it is always difficult to get feedback and actually this is something we're gonna address this time, hopefully. Um you get a very even from these very like dedicated um followers, they that sounded a strange way of saying it, <laughs> from this very engaged audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um those people are probably the most likely to play anything that we make, but um, even then you only get sort of a hundred responses from a, if you send it to 1500 people, um, you know, it's less than 10% response rate. And that's okay. Like we can just send it to more people. It's, it's fine. And a hundred responses actually, that's what we want is about that. Um, Cause any more than that becomes difficult to process any like uh written feedback you know just when people are just giving you their general impressions i can't read more than 100 of those without going crazy yes. um, and so this time we're going to do some analytics as well so the, the test build itself will report to us um what uh people did and obviously that stuff is going to be difficult to interpret and potentially misleading but we want to do it because with heat signature we just didn't hear from people who found the game too hard or mm -hmm. well, we did and then we fixed it for them and then we were getting all good feedback and no one was saying it's too hard uh, or, or the number of people saying it's too hard was absolutely negligible. Um, mm -hmm. And then when reviewers played it, uh, a load of them just bounced off it because they found it so difficult and they just couldn't do anything more than an easy or medium mission. And that's okay. The game is, is set up to provide you with those and it's supposed to cater to a wide range of difficulty. But that experience of if you can never graduate from a medium mission uh, that wasn't very well tested. And so the the rate of progress for unlocking the galaxy and progressing through the sort of meta um, stage of it, that was uh, just very grindy if you couldn't do hard or above missions. Like it was balanced so that it, you'd progress um, at a good rate if you were doing sort of hard missions and, and, and above. And we just didn't have enough feedback from people who found it that difficult. And so I, I suspect, obviously there's loads of biases that could lead to that. One is, we're testing with the most engaged people who are probably going to be say, experts. If you're, at, if you're pinging your mailing list, these are people who love your games specifically and also yeah. love love probably indie games, probably difficult indie games. So it makes sense. Yeah. But I also think that, uh, or I, I guess that uh, people who find the game difficult probably under report versus people who find it you know easy or if you really click with it and you um, go through a phase of like, uh, of mastery and then you get to the point that that uh, you need more difficult content, I think you're more likely to tell me that than if you try the game and it just find it brutally difficult, bounce off it, and you just kind of feel dispirited. I think there's probably some people who uh, blame themselves and thought like, oh, it's not the game's fault, I'm just bad at this game, sorry, I mm -hmm. don't want to hear from me because I shouldn't be even involved in this. Um, I think it's probably something at the other end of the spectrum where it's like just people are pissed off with the game and <laughs> don't, don't feel inclined to... Um, to help me uh, make it any better. Uh, and probably just just general, I don't know, if you just bounce off a game after like 10 minutes, um, you know, uh, maybe you just don't feel uh, any particular urge to, you know, fit in a, f 
a survey about it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So hopefully with analytics, we'll, if we do analytics, we will hear from, or we'll get some data from, from that. If, if there's a whole load of people who are just never played past level three, you will at least see that. Yeah, we generally, like for the Flame of the Flood, we did that. We did Google Analytics. We had um, we tested with our Kickstarter backers. So it was probably right. a similar situation to what you do. Like we had a couple that, oh, a couple hundred people were playing on Steam before we came out. Um, like they had a special Kickstarter early access and it that was extremely beneficial. The analytics was really, really useful. So right. I, I don't know, we'll see. I think you're still t probably testing with some of your most hardcore players though, most likely. Yeah, sure. Potentially. Yeah, you can, I mean, I guess shows are the only place that you can get a more, a wider net for people. Cause obviously like with testing just by sign up and by Steam keys and stuff, you're never really gonna reach people who aren't engaged. <laughs> like that's almost by definition, if they're signing up to test your game, they are um, that particular subset of the audience. Yeah. Whereas if you're at a show, they're like, well, I'm here. Uh, there's nothing else to do. Yeah, I yeah. guess that is a that is a benefit. Maybe that is the secret. We should go to shows and we should not have timers on our uh, on our systems. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see. What else was I going to talk to you about today? So, yeah, that's Tactical Breach Wizards. That's awesome. That's what you're up to now. Uh, you. I remember it's funny because you were talking about all this and that reminded me you did a YouTube video about difficulty that I thought was really fantastic. Where you were talking, oh, yeah, you were talking about how um, difficulty is so different between different, uh, uh, what is it? How people perceive difficulty differently, how um, some of it is randomness and, and luck. I'm trying to remember. It's been a while. Yeah, but... as my, my sort of uh, conclusion after, from all the games I've played and games I've made and worked on is that difficulty is basically random. It's just sort of for every given person in every given game it's just like a dice roll whether they're going to find it insanely hard or insanely easy um and there are some exceptions to that and there are there are trends and stuff but it's uh it's sort of a myth to to think of one particular game being sort of hard for everybody and one particular game being easy for everybody and so the i try to i just think that the big thing i want to avoid is being sort of judgy about difficulty about uh, you know, the whole discussion about accessibility versus difficulty and stuff uh, and the resistance to adding easy modes to things. I just think you, there are so many factors that go into how difficult someone is finding a game that it doesn't make sense to sort of judge them for it or to say anything along the lines of like, um, that, you know, oh, just push yourself, you know, you need, you need to be denied the easy mode so that you'll push yourself to, um, to master this and you'll discover something and, um, uh, go through the experience that I went through because uh, that's just based on an assumption that your brain works the same way mine does and even aside from like the most obvious sort of diagnosable accessibility issues I think there's a whole load of more subtle stuff as well on top of that that makes it even more difficult to know what anyone is really experiencing when they play a game yeah totally sorry I, I didn't mean to sidetrack us I just remembered that I really like that YouTube video the, um, <laughs> so you're on okay we I think I lost the thread here for your uh now you're on Tactical Breach Wizards. How many people do you have on this title so far? Uh, it's me, oh, three of us. Excuse three me. of us, <clears throat> of course. Um, yeah, so artist John Roberts and programmer John Winder and me. Nice. Are you thinking of, um, and you've been on this for about two and a half years. Are you thinking about growing yeah. the team at all? Or what are you, I don't, uh, that's not a bad thing. That was not a judgment, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, um, uh, I will answer that question. But yeah, we are, uh, not as far along as uh, you would think after two and a half years, partly because um, we spent about five months on heat signature updates, kind of on and off. Um, so we did a, uh, a major, major heat signature update a year after it launched. And for, the, for a lot of that year, we were doing other little updates. Um, and then also I moved to Canada and that has just taken months of admin work. The, the business complications of that because I have a company in the UK that's still making money uh, and uh, the immigration situation, everything, all these complexities don't just stack, they multiply. And so it's just been a nightmare just to make sure that I'm like, you know, following all the laws and rules and stuff um, and not losing a massive chunk of my company to being double taxed or all that kind of stuff. It's, uh, 
tedious, but that's been a big distraction. Um, and it's really just the start of this year that I've been getting back to it um, since the move and actually doing game dev on a regular basis, um, yeah. which uh, feels really good. Um, well, welcome back. Have, is most of your you. team in the UK? <laughs> How do you? Uh, no, just uh, John Roberts is in the UK and John Winder is in Seattle. So okay. it's actually, although uh, it's a shame I don't get to see um, artist John anymore. Um, I am on the same time zone as my programmer, which is a more important thing for coordination because with art, John kind of goes away and, and does it and then comes back with it. And then there's, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we discuss it, but we don't have to coordinate on a uh, like all day, every day. Whereas with programming, you kind of do like, yeah. especially because we're working with each other's code and it'll just, you'll get halfway through it and think, why does this do this? Or how do I, you know, work with this part? So yeah, that's a big help. I say, I was just wondering for payment, because I imagine like moving, the hardest thing is paying somebody from a Canadian account versus a UK account. Also the currency difference, now that I think about it. Yeah, that's... Boy, uh, I've just been through that because Brexit is about to happen and I expect the pound to go down as a result of that. And all of my money is in pounds. And so mm -hmm. we've been like a, a week ago, we were just like watching the, the exchange rate fall and waiting for all of my money to move from my UK bank account to a TransferWise account. Because once it's in a TransferWise account, I can switch currencies pretty um, immediately. But until it arrives in the TransferWise account, I can't do anything with it. And I'm just watching the exchange rate go dun, 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 <laughs> and trying not to do the maths on how much money I just lost. <laughs> Luckily, in that little period, it kind of went back up again. And we, I've changed it all now and at a good rate. Don't mm -hmm. tell me if the rate gets better for the pound. <laughs> I just don't want to know. It now. It's too stressful. No, don't. Oh, God. Um, OK, I'm going to answer your question because I said I would uh, in terms of scaling up the team. Uh, uh, the only thing we don't have at the moment is a composer. Um, I'm not looking for one yet because it just doesn't make sense with how far along we are with the game itself. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be a story driven game. And I think Again, there'll be like mission music will be the, the bulk of the work in terms of um, uh, that's what you're going to spend most of your time doing. And therefore, whatever is playing, then that will be a uh, we want to make very sure we get that right and have enough variety there. But it also might need I think there are going to be story moments. I think they're going to be kind of cutscenes, only very brief um, sort of most of it's going to be uh, dialogue um, trees like in Gunpoint uh, where you're mm -hmm. just making choices and um, talking to these characters. Um, but then there are a few moments in the in the plot as I've written it so far that sort of where we want to show rather than tell just one particular moment, just like character X, character Y, a thing happening between them. Um, and so I'm, I'm very interested in like when we come to do music, uh, it'll be very interesting to, to see what kind of what we can do to sell those moments and to because when you watch movies and stuff, it's incredible like if you really analyze it how much the music is controlling what you're seeing and what you're feeling about it like every now and then i i'll see a scene where i think the music is slightly mismatched um and it's really surreal it's because okay. when they're mismatched it's the music that wins like if there's a happy i think i was watching stump town and there was a, a chase through a building where what seemed to be happening the plot was pretty serious and dark but the music was super upbeat and when those two things clash, it's just, this is an upbeat scene. <laughs> just the fact that bad things are happening is just disregarded because the music overrules it. So I've never really got to do that with a game before because Gunpoint was story driven, but we didn't have sort of story moments and we certainly didn't have any music cues for those. Um, it was just, we tried to tailor the music for the mission to, to the sort of tenor of where you are in the, in the overall thing, but we didn't have particular moments that you have like a music sting, I guess. Yeah. Uh, or whatever the term is. Um, I'm so inexperienced with it, I don't even know what the term is for a short piece of music that accompanies a particular uh, moment in the story. But that'll be a fun thing to get into, I think. Well, that'll be good. That'll be fun to learn. I'm pretty sure it is Sting. If it's like a, a little kind of musical interlude, like a couple notes of this, here's what's happening. Yeah. yeah, that'll be fun. Dude, there's yeah. a saying in animation for like 3D animation that good, uh, good audio makes your animation 30% better. <laughs> like you can yeah. you can show somebody an animation, but you show it to them with sound effects later, and it's just so much. People are like, "Wow, you really improved that. That's a lot better." You didn't all yeah. it was the audio. It makes all the difference in the world. 
Yeah, and I keep making this mistake when I'm prototyping that I think I can test whether something's fun without sound, and you, you just can't. Like, I keep learning this over and over again. Oh, that wasn't fun because it had no sound. And as soon as you add the right sound to it, now it's fun again. Mm -hmm. Or just the idea of uh, making a weapon feel like it takes longer versus actually taking longer. Like, you can make a weapon feel like it takes longer without actually shortening the duration of, like, the reload or the, the shot time or right. anything like that, just through usually ver like vfx sound effects and sometimes a little bit of animation but did you hear the story about um uh enemy territory with the two different guns for the axis and allies no i didn't what so is there's uh people make games the youtube channel did a, an episode on this uh, and it's worth looking up and watching but uh the summary is uh when they're making enemy territory they had uh i think it was like the mp40 for the Axis versus something else for the allies. Um, and people complained that the Axis one was overpowered. Like the game is unbalanced because the, the standard um, assault rifle for the Axis was more powerful than the standard assault rifle for the allies. And actually, under the hood, the stats were exactly the same. It was literally the same. Uh, everything about the fire rate, the damage for every individual bullet, the accuracy, all of them were literally an identical gun, but they just had a more satisfying sound effect for the Axis. And so they were kind of like laughing at their play feedback, like, aha, these idiots, they, you know, they think um, uh, it's more powerful just because it sounds more powerful. And then they looked at the stats and found actually players do perform better with the one that they think is more powerful. So even though the guns are identical, players get way more kills with the one that sounds more satisfying. Yeah, dude, I do remember hearing that now. I heard that, uh, like I was reading that on Gamma Sutra or something. That's so funny. Yeah, that seems, yeah, that tracks with what I've heard too. Um, all right. Let's see here. I think that's going to be it for the podcast because uh, we've actually gone on for quite a bit. Um, so okay. thanks for joining me today, Tom Francis. No worries. Thank you. Uh, this has been Tom Francis and Gwen Frey, and you've been in the dialogue box. All right. How was that? Was that a good podcast? Yeah, that was fun. Thanks. I don't usually... Uh, I don't usually plan these enough. I was worried, like, maybe I should write, come up with a list of questions. Um, but I, I apologize for putting you on the spot about your game. I'm just always really curious about, like, that that early stage where you're just starting something. And Yeah, um, well, it's like, I don't know. A part of it is I took a week off from it, and I did some completely different other thing, and now I'm trying to get back into the same headspace again. And I'm just not there yet. Right. Like, I, yeah. I took off, and I did a side project that just totally didn't pan out. Um, because yeah. it turns out politics isn't funny and, uh, <laughs> who'd have thought, uh, yeah, yeah. So. that is like making a game that has like a message to it is also really tough. Um, like it's effective if you can do it, because if the player can like see the system or relationship you're trying to communicate happen before them, then that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. But at the same time there's no guarantee they'll interpret it the same way that you hope they will. No. And things like satire or sarcasm, if they don't come out correctly, you just like, it's just not good. Like you just seem like an asshole. That's the other thing. Like if you try to do satire, but you fail because nobody knows what you're satiring, then it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. Uh, so I like one of the ideas I had was I was going to spoof that. Um, there was a New York times poll where you would answer a questionnaire and it would tell you which a uh, candidate you should vote for. Um, but it, I figured I would do the same thing, but I would have a series of questions that you don't really care about and then like one that you do. And then it would tell you that you're actually for the opposite candidate, basically, uh, <laughs> versus the, just like just to spoof the poll, which I thought would be funny. But then if you haven't, if you don't know what this is about, it's actually not funny at all. So <laughs> in the end, all I did was figure out how to use Playfab to make a poll. Uh <laughs> It's been a week. It's been a week that becoming might come in handy. new BuzzFeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So let's, we're, we can talk to you nice, fine people in the chat now. I can read this. Uh, that question was answered. Given Gunpoint had little gameplay and heat signature has little to do with heat, I expect Tactile Breach Wizards will have none of the things in the title. Okay. <laughs> we, I mean, we're, Two and a half years in, it still has tactics, wizards, and breaching. So we're yeah. on a good course to have the first relevant name for one of my games, but <laughs> we'll see. This is actually the only name we've ever had where 
it sometimes gets a positive reaction just by itself. Um, like gunpoint and heatsinker chair. I've heard from people who sort of like those names, but it's never been like uh, I tell someone the name and their eyes light up or they have any kind of positive um, feeling about it at all. Whereas tactical breaches, it's not a large percentage of people, but just like 10%, maybe 5% of people hear it and they can immediately, they get the joke and they know what it's going to be about and they're, they're totally on board and that's really nice. All right, cool. People had questions, but it looks like other people answered them mostly. <laughs> uh, one one person would like us to redo the entire interview. Okay. Fraggle Rock wants <laughs> us to know that that was an excellent name, Tactical Breach Wizards. Um, uh, excellent. Thank you. Do you think the Humble Bundle was crucial in your career? Gunpoint was a 2014 bundle, monetarily or um, exposure wise, rewarding the question they asked. Okay. No, uh, it was nice, but it, like, it felt like it was going to be when we, uh, we, I think they reached out at some point and, uh, you know, said, we'd like to get you in a bundle sometime. And, uh, at the time that felt like, oh shit, this is, you know, the, I've made it, this is the moment. Um, uh, and so that's actually why we did a, a Linux and a Mac port, which took way longer than we thought. Um, and that was all just so we could be in a humble bundle basically. And by the time we'd done that and we actually were in one, the actual sort of size of them they hadn't gone down too much but the having been out on steam for a while and doing steam summer sale and steam winter sale uh, it got to the point where for us at least um a good steam sale is bigger than being in a humble bundle oh i believe that for your like gunpoint and yeah the uh i was gonna bring up something the um psionics made an announcement today or a couple days ago that they're discontinuing Linux support for, um, shit, what is that game? The game with the cars where you're, I'm stupid. The really popular game with the cars where you're playing that s <laughs> sport. Uh, uh, Rocket League? Rocket League, thank you. They're discontinuing Linux support and Mac support for it. And people are huh. like very upset because some people bought like free to play stuff in that game and so forth. Yeah, does that mean they can't play anymore or they just it won't get updates? They're yeah, they're removing the ability to do multiplayer. Um Wow. Which is kind of core cool to that game. I <laughs> it's like I mean, clearly I'm an expert in Rocket League, but uh, <laughs> I I thought so, yes. I thought that was core. Cool. I still have to read up on it. I haven't read much. But That's uh, actually um so I'm I'm sympathetic to to folks not doing a Linux or Mac version in the first place, because I also didn't for heat signature and mm -hmm. probably won't with, well, we don't know, it's too soon to say, but um, in general, it's, uh, uh, you can see, certainly with Linux, that it's often not worth it. Um, and, but especially that, that example is scary because you're taking it away from people who, who paid for it and, and have it currently. Yeah, um, it, it makes you wonder, like, can, is, if you buy a game and if you buy a multiplayer game, are people allowed to, like, are the developers, I mean, obviously they're allowed to just say, hey, we can't support the service anymore and discontinue a game. Are you, but to do that for just a segment of the game, to do that just for, only for Linux or Mac users feels different than if they just said, hey, we can't afford to support the game anymore. Instead, they're just saying, hey, it's just, it doesn't make sense for us to support Mac and Linux. Um, yeah. For some reason. It's one of many reasons I never want to do like a live game. Like mm -hmm. the, the idea that it, you just have to keep supporting it and doing stuff to it or it's going to die. And when you can no longer afford to devote resource to it, no one will be able to play it. That's terrifying. Yeah, totally. It makes me wonder about like the, just in general, the future too. I don't know. Like, cause I mean, we are moving towards a, with subscription models, it is possible to, in Stadia, it's possible to move towards a future where a game is only there for a certain amount of time and then eventually it's just sort of gone. Because maybe if, what if the future is only some dysto, uh, you choose my words carefully here so I don't burn a business card. <laughs> but like, what if, uh, what if there was a future where, for instance, there is only streaming from something like Stadia and then the computers behind the scenes get updated and you, it doesn't make sense to support what we what's an old game we have now like people still play source engine games people still play um counter-strike source right uh yeah. imagine a world where that just can't happen because well not enough people are playing now and so we have to support left for dead instead and uh 
we're not going to update Counter Strike Source to the latest uh, Stadia SDK or whatever. And now that game's just sort of gone forever. I don't know. Yeah. We might move. I mean, I, it's hard to imagine that offline games. Uh, I don't know. Is it? I was going to say it's hard to imagine that they go away completely. That they wouldn't still be like an you know an underground scene and the, you know piracy and uh, ways of of doing these things. Multiplayer games is is already pretty tricky to to get them working off the official servers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think we've partly, maybe not accepted it, but we sort of it's that's already the case with so many games, right? You know, as soon as an MMO is stopped supporting, it's it's kind of dead, um, and. Uh, to some extent, we're we're getting acclimatized to that possibility. I think that the scary, the part of that scenario that sounds very different to to our world that is unpleasant is like, uh, don't take away my single player games. Like if I'm yeah. happily playing something on the computer and you you just say I can't now, that's that would suck. Yeah, or just in general, the idea that you own a game, like, is it possible for somebody to? I don't know. Uh, I mean, there was a Steam update at one point, or there was a Mac update at some point that made it so that anybody who's making a Mac game had to uh, recompile their game. I, I know yeah. there, was, there was some shit that went down. I don't. Claim, I'm was... not plugged into it because I didn't make any Mac ports for the. Uh, like we did do a Mac port for the Flame and the Flood, but I I've left, so I'm not really sure if they had to deal with that. Did you not do it for Kine? No, I don't. Uh, it was kind of was a, just me, like uh, yeah, yeah. But you did so many project. platforms, or I guess you did so many storefronts, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I did. I paid. Um, so I hired a company to help me out with all the non PC platforms. So Stadia, yeah, because you did PS3, right? You did Switch, like two consoles, PS4. three consoles. Jesus. Yeah, I did all three consoles and Stadia. <laughs> Yeah, at the same time, that was Brave. a mistake. I regret that. <laughs> like, there was no reason for that. Like there, there just wasn't. Like uh, I'll, I'm, like, I could show you the numbers. It didn't make sense. Like I should have just done uh, pu a puzzle game, like kind. People want to play it when they're traveling. It makes sense for that to be on the Switch. It makes sense yeah. to be on Stadia because I got a lot of really like great support out of Stadia. Um, the Xbox and the PS4. I don't know if it was really a great fit there or if that was smart. I think most of those people would have just bought it on PC anyway. Um, I mean, I can see the the rationale of just like if this is your one shot, you want to make sure you get the every possible dice roll you can. You know, and it, who knows? Maybe Xbox is the one that it takes off on for some reason. Because each, you know, if releasing a game is a, is a bit of a crapshoot, then you want to have as many rolls of the dice as you can. Yeah, I, I mean, it was the counterpoint to that though is I had to split my attention so much that I didn't yeah. really build a like a good relationship with any given partner. Uh, right. I didn't really, I don't know. I don't feel like, I don't know what I should have done. That's the other thing, but I don't, <laughs> I definitely didn't do whatever it is I should have done on the PS4 and the Xbox One. You have a very long question here. Uh, oh. Hello, Tom. I recently loved your recent take on information games. Thanks for coining that term. Are there any mechanics you think would work well with such games or how could information gathering be made into a mechanic itself? Hmm. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the name um, for games like uh, Return of the Obra Dinn, Her Story, um, The Outer Wilds and uh, Heaven's Vault where like the the thing you're trying to get is information, and you're also using information to get more information. Um, I ranted, I, I did one video on this where I just sort of talking about that term, and then another one where I <laughs> ranted for ages about why conspiracy boards are amazing. And uh, you know, the thing where you have red string joining these little notes and and we're planning to do one of those for tactical breaches. I'm very excited to, to if I have time, um, this will be like a treat job for me. Like if I if I've just done with some big, heavy, boring system, I'll I'll treat myself by making a, a red string board um, to map out the plot. Um, I think it, it, like specific mechanics for information games. Um, I think it makes sense to focus on tools for supporting your uh, seeking of information and filtering of information and. And, and memorizing it and keeping track of what you have found and what you haven't. I think almost all of those games uh, struggle with or haven't gone far enough in that direction. Um, we were uh, 
uh, I was playing her story yesterday with some friends and just sort of, you know, looking back at it and um, uh, discussing it. And uh, it made me wish that you could uh, like use Google logic in the search bar for that game where you could like subtract words and filter in that kind of way. Um, Oberdin, I, I desperately wanted to just be able to have like a list of all the memories and just be able to jump into one just from a single menu so that if I want to compare this memory and this memory, I don't have, also have to then consult a map and walk around the ship and go inside two different corpses to get back to where I was. And then I've forgotten what I was comparing it to and all that stuff. Mm. Um, so I think it's good to have like tools. Uh, it's almost like making an app where you kind of, you want it to be as user friendly and supportive of, of what the user's trying to do as, as you can, because the game side of it, the fun side of it is not going to be mechanics. Like that's the fun thing about information games is that you, uh, at their best, you are progressing by making leaps of logic in your own mind just based on what naturally makes sense and not on specific puzzle rules. Mm -hmm. So, but isn't there like a something to having to remember it, something to having to get out an old fashioned <laughs> pen and paper and write it down? Isn't there like an appeal to that for at least some people? Maybe, not yeah. for me. Like I'm on board with I, you, but. I do. I have a positive association with taking notes from games. And I think a lot of it just comes from the fact that that only happens if I'm engaged enough to want to go to that effort. And also the game is, has enough going on that's complex enough that it needs some note taking. I don't think either of those things would go away if the note taking was built into the, the game. And, um, and in fact, I think you could do it in some cool ways where um, letting the player like scribble on the screen um, uh, and or type notes and uh, like screenshot stuff and just put it in the corner. I think stuff like that would be really cool. Just the thing, kind of things you can do in Windows anyway, but um, just facilitated and, and kind of fictionalized, made it part of the fantasy, especially if you're like a detective or um, like a cyber detective and you're snooping through, um, you know, you get access to somebody's computer and there's a big list of passwords. You hit the screenshot button and then put that in a folder on your desktop so that you got it for later rather than having to like write it out on a piece of paper. I mean, I kind of played the witness like that. I was, um, it bothered me a lot that the witness, the best tool for solving puzzles in the witness was alt tabbing out to Photoshop and drawing on a screenshot that I'd taken to try different things. Like the whole game was about draw tracing through these mazes. And so it was weird to me that the best tool for, for trying things in that, in that scenario was to, just scribble over a screenshot in Photoshop. And I thought like, if that's the case, then I want an in-game tool to do that. Uh, and we know you make games by uh, finding other games and finding a problem <laughs> that you want to fix. So now we know yep. the next game from Tom Francis is going to be New The Witness. Yeah, um, I guess that's that's the intersection of like being a critic and being a game developer is, is games that are inspired by criticism. <laughs> well, I mean, there's something too, you love something so much uh, you kind of start to see the flaws in it and that sort of thing. Like, I actually get where you're going with that. Um, yeah, I don't care about the flaws and stuff I don't like. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's, exactly. those are games where, like, there's a million flaws to this, but I also don't like it, so that doesn't get me fired up. I don't want to make a game about that. Uh, it's only when I love something and there's then, but I just want to fix this. Yeah, that's true. Um, all right, I'm sorry. I'm neglecting the chat because they keep having questions for you and I'm ignoring them. Uh, to continue your thought about Humble becoming less relevant, by the time you released. Uh, do you worry about longer dev times, meaning your market could change by the time you release? Are you trying to develop uh, Tactical Breach Wizards faster Whoops, than <laughs> Um That's a jerk question. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's totally reasonable. Uh, I always come away from a game thinking, well, next time we're not making something that big. We're going to make something smaller mm -hmm. and it's going to be quicker to make and it's going to be more in line with like, kind of going with the grain of what games want to be. I thought I was doing that with Heat Signature. I thought like gunpoint, making like having story and puzzles and hand making every puzzle was such an inefficient way of making content, of making playtime basically, you know, three years ending up being three hours seemed like a really bad exchange rate to me. Mm -hmm. I now realize having made multiple other games that uh, that was an incredibly good exchange rate because that was three years of spare time for a. Um, you know, a game that felt complete and that people liked, and that was a bargain. <laughs> I've never got that efficient uh, since. Um, because, I mean, I'm making this problem for myself because every time I 
start a new game it's in a genre i've never done before uh oh, like which was it's the first 3d game we've ever done um mm. uh i've i haven't really done turn-based or grid-based before i i did make a hex grid-based uh side project that was um just like a five-week project um but that <laughs> i did by no means did i uh uh learn how to make a grid system because i just kind of didn't <laughs> um so do you do that often but anyway, do you do little side projects like that not often morph blade is the only commercial one i've ever done um uh, well it's it's the third commercial ga- well we have three commercial games out and then so technically tactical breaches would be the fourth but it's kind of the third big one morph blade is a small one um i also did floating point after gunpoint which is just a another I think it was about three weeks, and that's just free on Steam, uh, just about swinging a grappling hook around. Mm-hmm. Um, and both of those were, I think I only end up making a five day, five week game if I try to make a two day game. <laughs> and so the scope is extremely small for those. Um, and I don't have like a middle setting. There's only like completely done with the game in five weeks or three and a half years. <laughs> Yeah. And I haven't figured out what a one-year game looks like or a, a one-and-a-half-year game looks like. And in terms of the market changing, I think um, for me, it's all about Steam. Steam is where we make almost all of our money. And I feel like we are usually in a good spot on Steam in that the kinds of games I make are uh, different enough that they're, they're not perceived as like clones or anything but they're at the same time they're not really that um not really bucking the major trends almost all of my games have guns in them um they are appealing to a bunch of things that that they're very uncontroversial amongst gamers (laughs) like if you like video games my video games are going to be basically acceptable to you (laughs) you're not going to be like what the fuck is this it's not like gone home where it sort of um challenge people's perceptions of what games could or should be of course gone home did really well so that wasn't a problem but, yeah, but um, there's, no but there's something good to just doing a doing this thing very well i think uh superset games is another great example like i love i love their work with ftl and uh i subset they, a subset yeah sorry i'm having brain problems today <laughs> like um subset games uh yeah with into the yeah. breach and ftl like those are two extremely different games and they that's a team of two dudes who seem to just really want to take a game in a genre and do a tight, beautiful version of it. I think they're actually on a similar, like I've never really talked to them, but they seem to be on a kind of similar time scale to the sort of games you make as well, right? Yeah, we, um, so us, Subset and um, Fulbright all had our first games in the same year and our second games in the same year, I think, or within a year of each other. Um, oh yeah, but Steve Gaynor is like. We're all on our third games now. Steve Gaynor is totally different, though. You're right. Like that, Gone Home is just a. I that was just different. Like it was just a <laughs> challenging what games could be. I think it's a good way to. Yeah, play. I mean, yeah, it's it's hard to understand. It's hard to foresee how, um, how games that deviate from the norm will do. And that's kind of what I was saying. It's just basically, I feel like I'm, we're in quite a safe place. We're not doing anything too risky or adventurous with with like what a game is. And so the sort of year to year shifts in people's feelings and what they're interested in don't scare me too much. Uh, I'll be very scared if Steam goes away. <laughs> I'll be very scared if Steam does something like really drastic with its how it shows content to people. If it if it went fully human curated, that would scare me. Um, I don't. I don't believe that's going to happen personally. Speaking, uh, I should just say that speaking purely selfishly, that's just like my my forecast for my own success um, is like seems to be going well so far. So uh, for me, I need Steam to be not too drastically different. For other people, it, it um, might well be better. Uh, but yeah, I, I also don't think they would ever do that. Um, and I don't even really want them to do that. I, I think the the only thing that would get valve more flack than doing algorithmic um uh discoverability is if they didn't <laughs> like the the, the shit storm there would be if there are actually humans at valve choosing this stuff would would be oh, even I just, more i just think they're so large that changing it at all will get them so much flack like yeah. because every if they any tiny they could do nothing and people will think that there's been some tweak to the algorithm people are 
following and scraping their data. There's so much um, studying of Steam in general that changing anything yeah. or experimenting at all, I actually feel bad for them. If they if they tried to do that, like developers would be furious. Um, because you're you're basically even if what they're trying to do is improve the storefront, anytime you make any give a huge change, you're you're messing with people's source of income, right? Um, yeah. So. Yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah. I actually I had a weird discrepancy where I was noticing, you know, you can like see how many people are landing at your store pages on Steam. Um, mm -hmm. I was looking at that for Gunpoint and Heat Signature, and uh, Steam was just sending like three times as many people to Gunpoint's page than it was to Heat Signatures, and Heat Signature was still outselling it. So way more of the people who landed at Heat Signature's page were, were buying it, and um, they were just sending loads of people to Gunpoint's page who weren't buying it. Um, and so I reached out to them to say like, hey, you know, this doesn't seem right. Maybe shouldn't the algorithm be putting some more people to Heat Signature? And they basically, they looked into it and said, oh yeah, you're right, there's a bug here, but the bug is it's sending too many people to Gunpoint's page, so we just fixed that, so now you do get less to Gunpoint as well. <laughs> so shit, I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Hold on. Let me read through this. Do you have any secret squirrel stats from Stadia? Uh, I can't answer that. I thought there was something else for you. Maybe I missed it. Do you, how, what was it like when you, because when you launched Kine, you'd already sort of, I think you said it already paid for itself, right? In terms of the epic deal. Um, yeah. So were you, when my games launch, I'm so fucking glued to that sales chart and just watching every hour and like living and dying by every little thing. Was it like yeah. that for you still or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, so the way I distracted myself was I did a Reddit AMA on the day I launched. Right. And so I was just literally glued to that AMA. Um, and yeah, I was watching people, uh, how many downloads you get. You still care how good the game is. Um, yeah, of course. And you still kind of want to crush past that minimum guarantee and get more money if yeah. possible right <laughs> uh yeah so it's uh i don't know it is nice having the hedge against um failure especially for a risky game at the, yeah. at the end of the day like a cartoony narrative puzzle game doesn't quite have the same some of them take off it, it, it's more of a hits driven i don't know how to put this all of games are hits driven some games are riskier to work on than others uh, yeah. Some games are more likely to succeed in the marketplace, specifically for Steam, than others. And I do think one of the things I bring up about Steam is that I do believe, at the end of the day, if you look at the number of Steam users, you're only looking at a third of the PC marketplace. There's a shit ton of people who just don't have Steam because they play games hmm. on other things. Um, there's a lot of people who only play World of Warcraft or only play uh, League of Legends. You know what I mean? There's these different launchers have different audiences. The Steam audience, I would suspect, based on the kinds of games they play, they strategy games do super well on Steam compared to other places. Like if you look at the um, if you look at the top games on Steam versus the top games on Epic Game Store, you'll see the top games on the Epic Game Store. In, I would argue, hue closer to what I would think a Fortnite player would play. So right. Subnautica was their best free to play game. Um, hmm. What is it? The that Gearbox game was their best uh, paid game, and the if they have look, charts for the free stuff. Uh, they don't have charts, but Team Sweeney's tweeted a couple times what the, oh, right. the best free games are. Um, and so, in general, I suspect that if you want to make a game that's tactical or strategy and so forth, I think the best marketplace for you by far is Steam. Um, mm. uh, and who knows? That could all change. But I think if you are making a game that is multiplayer and looks a lot like Fortnite, then the Epic Game Store might actually be a better place for your game. Uh, maybe, yeah. it's hard to say. The different star phones just have different bents. And I was interested in like, one of the things that interests me long-term looking at Epic and seeing how that audience is different um, and possibly closer to the audience on the Switch versus the audience on Steam. Mm, is the Switch the right analogy? I don't know. I suspect. I don't have numbers, right? But I would suspect that the average, the mean age of somebody who's on the Epic Games Store is probably slightly younger than the mean age of somebody that's on Steam. And yeah. I would suspect that the genres that they're interested in may be slightly different, or the art styles that they pursue. Like I suspect a grim dark game um, probably belongs a little bit more on Steam than perhaps belongs on Fortnite, or, or sorry, on, on the Epic Games Store, 
uh, yeah. next to Fortnite and so forth. I don't know though. We'll see. Like it's, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, especially because so much of it's always changing, and uh, I've I'm sometimes wrong. So, <laughs> I, like I don't. I personally don't. I'm seeing Valve pursuing VR very, very uh, heavily, and personally, I'm not into VR. I, I don't know how to put it. Like I, I'm into it as a developer. I think it's interesting. I think there's things about VR that I enjoy from like an academic perspective, but I've worked in VR and I know, yeah, it's changed, but spending more than a couple hours in VR is not fun. Uh, and yeah. if you want to make a game that people sit down and sink into and want to experience for a while, I just don't see VR being that. But again, I haven't tried like Alex with it and I don't have the newer headsets. I've got like a DK2, um, so we'll see. Uh, this is just a giant rambling thought. <laughs> um, is Gwen in a Herman Miller and body chair? I don't know. It is not the most expensive chair. <laughs> I would have to look that up. Hold on. You can, I think I love doing now is uh, my phone has Google Lens on it and you can point that at stuff and just like say, what is this? And I do that all the time, just find out like, what is this TV? Like I need the driver for this thing or something. Oh, that's creepy. Cause that's just gonna go straight into facial recognition before you know it. So it'll just be like, who is Tom Francis? We're already there. <laughs> yes, it is a Herman Miller body chair. It's amazing you know that. This was actually like a gift. Well, I got a, a discount as a gift for it um, because these are super expensive, but it has uh, fixed my uh, hand problems, so. Usually towards the oh, end cool. of a project, I always get some kind of like tendonitis or like I get some mm. kind of carpal tunnel. Yeah, but I've had that. Weirdly, the chair fixes it. I've, my array of like input devices for PCs now is just a like bizarre collection of, of weird uh, oddities. I have like a vertical mouse and then like a roller mouse. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's like, yep. it looks like a wrist rest for a keyboard, but with like a, a rolling bar on it. Um, and then I have a, like a, a handheld trackball thing where you don't need to put it down on anything and it's just it's not like sensing its position in space it's just a trackball but it just means you don't have to be like sitting at your desk kind of thing to use it. so when you're in an art team in AAA, you will see all the array of these sorts of things <laughs> because all you do all day is your hands but uh if you're in the programming team that's when you see the weird ass keyboards like the people who've got like the split keyboards who've got like really yeah. weird setups in that way um, because if you're an artist, you'd want to structure your entire life such that your right hand never has to come off of your mouse. So you do everything right. you can to make sure that everything's on the left side of your keyboard. You don't care what that <laughs> is. That could be shitty. Uh, but your mouse has to be perfect. Right. Do you? A lot of my artist friends, I'm jealous of them because they can listen to podcasts while they work or they can even like watch movies while they work. Mm -hmm. And if everything I do involves words and that part of my brain can't, you know, be absorbing them and outputting them at the same time, um, What's it like for animating? So podcasts, uh, like it depends when you go to, so I was always a technical animator. So I was always like scripting the animation trees and that sort of thing right, as well. Yeah. Um, or I'd be rigging, which isn't like writing for me, at least is like writing a lot of Python and that sort of thing. And it's hard to listen to podcasts when you do that. But once you get to the point where you're just animating, there's a certain point where it's like, well, stub this in i know it works and now i just need to animate it i need to turn off my brain and do that and it's really mm. nice to have like podcasts or twitch streams or stuff you can listen to same yeah. thing with different art stuff like that um i've i get to do a little bit of it where um i will sometimes sketch ui designs now because i have uh, like an apple pencil and uh, doing that on paper was always a pain in the ass because I, I make so many mistakes and i can't undo them <laughs> unless you want to fuck around with actually like rubbing things out um and just having like an undo when drawing uh, is a game changer for me. And so now I really like any UI design stuff I'm really keen to do because I can do it on my iPad and just sit there and um, potentially listen to podcasts and also not worry about the consequences of my actions. Yeah, that's interesting. I suck at UI, like so bad. <laughs> like it's unbelievably bad. Uh, I don't think, I mean, I, I played uh, kind, I didn't notice any uh, UI problems. Well, that's because you didn't see like the 10 different iterations of the UI <laughs> before that, where I had well, no idea. Like there's- That's the, not sucking at UI, that's just the process, right? 
Yeah, I guess. Like, there was a point when I was like, well, what you need is these, like, there's a narrative and things are happening in certain places. So you should have to click on the place and then you should have to choose the mission. And it's just, but that made no sense because you sometimes, you would go here and then you'd go back over here and you'd go here. But there's nothing in the UI that, like, it, it just made no sense for the longest time. And in the end, I just cut everything down to the bare minimum. Like, <laughs> what is ex only what you need to see? Uh, cut out everything else and keep it as simple as possible and it was acceptable to ship. But like, I wouldn't, I'm not proud of that UI in any way. I find it so interesting that um, there are all these like rules about how things should behave that we kind of know on some level, but we don't know it intellectually. And so you design a system where you think, okay, when I, I want this to be selected when I click this button. And if I want to deselect it, I click the button again. And then you try that and you're like, this is garbage. Like, this is horrible to have to click the button again to deselect. What you actually want to happen is when you click anywhere else, you should deselect it. And there's all these little rules like that where as soon as you try it, you know this is how it should be instead. But you can't know it ahead of time, or at least I don't. Um, and I think that would, I guess, like being really good at UI would just be having a huge catalog of those learned rules about like, oh, no, it always feels bad if you do it this way. And once you try it, you'll know it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. I believe that is probably true. I have not yet learned the rules. Uh, I learned those rules very slowly and publicly on Twitch because I streamed a lot of times. <laughs> so people got, to, you can go back and like look at some of the shittier UI. Um, Did you have anything? I, I always find there's one thing per project where I stick to my guns on some esoteric decision and everyone fights me on it and they say, you're wrong. Don't do it that way. Don't do it that way. And eventually after like a year, I realize, oh yeah, you're all right. I'm wrong. I should just change it. <laughs> do you have anything like that? Oh God, probably. Let me think. Uh, for heat signature, it was um, I wanted point and click movement controls. So like you click where you want to go, and then the guy just pathfinds to there. And then like to shoot along the way. Uh, uh, initially, it was just like a slow mo thing. You kind of hold the button down, and like while you're pathing around, you'd slow go into slow mo and aim at people. And everyone was saying, "Do WASD controls? Do WASD controls?" I had it in my head that there was some kind of that my game would be more accessible if you could play it almost all with just the mouse. Um, Mm -hmm. but everyone's right and I was completely wrong. <laughs> it was definitely needed to be WSD. The pathfinding is still in there, but it's it's uh, like a extra option and what WSD was, is the main way to play. Do you know the, um, what is it? Do you know the moment when you realized, like what was it that changed your mind? I, it was very gradual because I, I mm. enough people wanted WSD that I put it in as a secondary option. And then we did some like user testing and asked people um, what they wanted and that the feedback asking for it like mounted up and mounted up to the point that it was, became absurd not to uh, seriously consider it. And then when I was playing with WSD, I just find like, oh, I'm just better at this game now. Like this is just, uh, I'm able to do things I can't do with the other system. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think at one point uh, the ability to, um, so in kind you, may, you move in discrete movements and it never made sense to me that you should be able to push down a button and just continue to do that movement because you, you'll just roll over and then hit yourself. So why would you want that? But everybody asked for it and I eventually put it in. Um, <laughs> and it did make, it did help for certain levels. So hey, there was that. And um, speeding up redoing a level. Oh God, I remember one. Actually, no. The, um, when you restart a level, not playing the narrative scene in the beginning. Because it's important, Tom. It frames your purpose <laughs> in the level. Uh, but people didn't want to see that twice, which you would think I would have uh, learned. I, yeah, uh, I definitely would have been one of those people asking for that feature. <laughs> yeah. That was a big one. Uh, all right. I think we're the questions are probably tapering out. I'm not very good at reading. I think these guys are mostly talking to each other. So I think this is it for this Twitch stream. Unless you guys have any final questions. For Tom before we let him enjoy his Sunday. <laughs> no, I think that's it. Thanks for joining me today. Cool. No worries. Thank you. All right. Um, oh, shit. There is one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. One last question from Charlie Gravy. <laughs> when starting a project, is there a decision limbo for choosing between commercially viable versus artistically focused features? <laughs> uh, no, not for me. I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about either and it's all just based on what what excites me what i want to play what would be a game that i would um be excited to 
I guess buy, but you know, mainly just that I would want to play for a long time. And um, it's very instinctive. It's just very like, oh man, it'd be so cool if you could do this. Um, and all of my, or oh, the biggest stroke of good luck I've had, I think, is just that my tastes are in line with a whole load of people who want to buy indie games. Mm. And I kind of learned that through being a critic, <clears throat> where I would find there's a lot of people who like the same kinds of things I like. And that's one of the best superpowers you can have as a developer is just like, oh, great, I just get to make what I want to make. And then it will just turn out that people also want it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right, we have to let Tom go. We were killing his voice. You can hear it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, we've clearly destroyed him. All right, so thanks for being on here. We're going to take off now. Later, Tom. Thanks. Uh...